What's up, everybody? Here for Panther Source. I'm Trip Morgan. This is Billy Harless. What's up, Billy? How you hey, doing? How you guys doing tonight? We're going to bring y'all Week 15 preview. Green Bay Packers coming into Charlotte, play the Carolina Panthers. Aaron Rodgers is back. Obviously, that's the talk of the week. Um, he's supposed to go undefeated from here to the Super Bowl, apparently. Um, we're going to get into that. But on the phone, I have our good friend from the Riot Report, Josh Klein. They've been killing it. Um, if you're not if you're not checking them out, check them out at therightreport.com, and I'll get his uh, we'll get his social media tags. But Josh, how you doing, buddy? Fantastic, brother. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Hoping uh, I I can't lie to you, man. I was I think I can speak for us all. I know y'all said on your it, it is what it is podcast, and it is what it was in this case, I guess. But it was a huge win no, this past screwed, Sunday over the Vikings. You screwed up the. <laughs> Screwed up the catchphrase, man. I know it's a tough one to come up with. Believe me. Wait, man, y'all. Me eight weeks to get it. Y'all roll that thing off the tongue, off of every little twist there is, and like I'm slowing it down in my head as you're saying it, and I'm like, he he actually got it right. So I can't I, I can't do it. That's that is what it ain't. So and I still don't think I said it yeah. right. But, <laughs> but no, man. So uh, like we were talking about before, I know you're I know you're enjoying this three game homestand after you know back and forth on the road. Um, like I said, y'all been killing it out there doing coverage and stuff. Y'all at all the games and whatnot. Um, so how how are you enjoying that? Let it, how's that? How are you doing? Well, you know, it's it's always a little bit more fun when the Panthers are are winning. So uh, you know, the last six weeks have been really really fun, and it is nice to be back here in Charlotte. Not just for obviously I speak personally, but just for the uh, for the home fans here and for the players themselves. You know, it, it's when you travel when you travel three out of four weekends in a month it can get to be a nice it can be get to be a grind and imagine trying to go out and do something when you're in peak physical shape after flying back and forth across the country um i couldn't imagine it you know i get tired out just uh sitting in the press box eating hot dogs um so i (laughs) I thought they can't imagine i thought they fed y'all better than that now come on no, no, it's all hot dogs and pizza. And then my wife is like, I don't understand why your diet's not working. And it's like, ah, because I eat pizza for like seven hours a day on Sunday. Uh, well, I mean, I guess that is something quick. And I mean, pizza's delicious. I, guess, I mean, what kind of pizza? Is it, is it like a local or is it like a chain? Oh, don't get me wrong. I am not <laughs> complaining about pizza by any means. That's that's not going to be the corner that I stand on. But uh <laughs> No, it's uh, at Bank of America. There's uh, there's some Papa John's up there after the game, um, but it's uh, but it is it's hot dogs at halftime. So, um, I'm, I and I do love me some hot dogs, hot dogs and cookies. It's it's like literally like a uh, like a child's meal. But I mean, sports writers really were just children, uh, <laughs> all grown up. Well, there you go, guys. The inside scoop on the delicious food in the press box. <laughs> um, so, no, we're going to jump right into things here, as we always do to preview. We start with injury updates for the Panthers. Josh, I know it got released today. Obviously, Shaq Thompson still uh, battling plantar fasciitis. We knew that was probably going to be a lingering thing, and it's something he needs to just get rest with. I know that's just like with basketball players. It's a popular injury there. But uh, him, and then, of course, the big one, to me anyway, is Trey Turner – got put into a concussion protocol Monday, came in and talked to head trainer Ryan Vermillion and apparently had some kind of symptoms and they immediately put him in there. You have any um, insight on that? Um, no, no, not necessarily any insight. Uh, just that, you know, I, I was reading some stuff on Twitter that people were saying, you know, shame on the Panthers for not putting him into the protocol on Sunday. And, you know, concussion symptoms, they don't have to turn up immediately as soon as you get hit in the head right. um, like Tom Savage. You know, you don't have to have a seizure out there on the field to have a concussion. And, uh, and there's, not, there's, no, there's no evidence, especially from the Panthers. The Panthers have been so careful with guys that have concussions, that have been concussed in the past and, and have been so, uh, you know, are willing to go above and beyond. I, I just I can't see them thinking that Trey may have had a concussion and keeping him out there on the field. So I think that it did, you know, it popped up on Monday. They're, they're handling it right now. Um, but I think that you may, we may need to kind of make plans uh, to not see Trey Turner on Sunday. Yeah, I tend to agree. And I know, you know, it's very similar. It's really a bad deja vu. I, I actually tweeted that earlier today when it got announced. 
because it reminds you of Michael Orr from last year after the Vikings game. I mean, he came in the day after the game and was, like, complaining of headaches, and then next thing you know, he's retired. Yeah, that's that's a uh, that that's a good point. I actually didn't even think about that, but yeah, it's a uh, you know, not that Turner's going to do are, that, obviously. But you know, no, 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 of course. But concussions are to me, concussions are the scariest, uh, are the absolute scariest injury that a football player can have because it, it's not like a bone that kind of you break your arm, your arm heals, and then you're not. You don't have a broken bone anymore. Exactly. Concussions. When you have a concussion, the next that means the next time that you get a concussion, it's easier to get another concussion, and it's easier to get another concussion. It's easier to get another one. So it's not. It, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and and the brain is not something that you want to mess around with. So it it's a scary situation. Yeah, and it. I mean, it's obviously concerning. We hope it's, of course, nothing serious, and that he's able to go Sunday. But it's, in my opinion, it's unrealistic. No, a knowing the Panthers. And B, I mean, it's like I said, it's a concussion. It's if he got it put in Monday, I just it can be a hard thing to clear on you know a, a, on a one week time frame like that. And they have some guys there which we can talk about as well. You got you know I know Tyler Larson's taking reps there, Taylor Moten, and then Amini Silatolu, correct? Yes. Um, I, if you're, I, I think that it's going to be Tyler Larson. Okay. Um, that's going to be taking the reps at guard. Uh, come Sunday, if if Trey is not able to go, which I, I think there's a pretty good chance he's not, um, I do think that they just have such they have such faith in in Tyler that you know the guy's been manning the middle for the last ten games essentially for the entire season, and I think when it comes down to it in December, you put your best five guys out there, and now is not the time to put a untested rookie out there I, I just that's that's my that's my take on it and i think that ron is probably gonna do the same thing yeah i tend to agree um, yeah i would definitely agree with that <clears throat> i'd rather see larson out there than something we've seen untested on the field because larson did he's held his own yeah especially at the center spot and also you know i, I was kind of interested to see if taylor moten might get a role because i know part of the reason they drafted him was his flexibility at right tackle and guard but it's like you said, I mean, they've showed a lot of faith in Tyler Larson. Obviously, they kind of had to in some sorts with Khalil, Ryan Khalil being out at center. But um, Sila Tulu, Tulu being out there, would that would kind of bother me. I'm not even going to lie. That would be my last option, seeing what's happened when he's came in for reps and games. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, I think it's it's going to be Tyler Larson. Um, and then I, I think they just they like that, that idea of a veteran presence. Um, but here's my thing is that I think that, you know, these guys watch Taylor Moten and they watch Amini Silatola and they watch Tyler Larson and practice every day. The coaches do. And I feel like, you know, if Taylor Moten was going to overtake these guys because he's so much better then he would have done it in practice, you know, that, that's yeah. my thing. Is and that, that's, and that's what I'm saying. I, like, it's, it's interesting to me that. You know, we keep talking about we. You know, during training camp, there was a lot of hype around him. Obviously, we we spent a second round pick. We were excited getting the right tackle, and we he's you know he comes in on jumbo packages as that flex guy, and you think at the beginning of the year, but I was like, well, you know, he could take over that right tackle spot from Darrell Williams. Now, Darrell Williams is rated one of the best right tackles in the league right now, and all of a sudden the right guard spots pop. You know, with this situation, and it's kind of like. Well, Larson might be taking that too, and it makes you start wondering he's not earning it in practice, maybe. And I think that's what you're saying, that's, correct? That that's kind of what it seems like to me. And I I don't know whether it's a situation where he's not earning it in practice, or whether they're just, or whether somebody like Tyler Larson is just not giving it up. Right. I mean, don't forget Tyler Larson has basically held his own at center uh, for the last for the equivalent of a full season. You know, yeah. I mean, he's played on the road in Seattle. He's played, you know, he's gone up against some of the best defensive linemen in the league, and um, and and he hasn't performed poorly. I don't. I mean, he hasn't been Ryan Khalil out there, but he also has not been. You know, I, I can't think of an example of a bad center off the top of my head, but he has not been a bad center. Yeah, those those names don't normally just roll off the tongue. <laughs> bad centers and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the the tackles and guards come a little bit easier, but a bad center, I uh, just don't have it. Yeah. 
Um, Wadi Divots, if you will. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then there was something else that kind of came loose today at practice, if you will, if that's a good term for it. Captain Munderland left practice early, and it was reported later that he was kind of upset with the way his role was going to be this, in this week's game plan going against Green Bay. Obviously, he, he stepped up. Him and Colin Jones played a lot more this past week with Shaq Thompson being out. And Shaq could be out again this week. And Rivera addressed it in his presser saying he didn't want to discuss it. It was personal. But uh, Munderland talked to some guys while Cam Newton's interview was going on. Is that correct? Y'all were in there? Um, yeah. Down with that he, exactly? he spoke to the media. He, um, you know, Captain Munderland has made it pretty clear all – uh, all season that he is not particularly happy with the amount of playing time that he's getting. Um, I think he thinks that he signed a contract in the off season to come back here and be a guy that plays 70 or 80 percent of the snaps. And I and he has the personality to where he is not going to sugarcoat it and make it sound like he feels fine about um, about what he feels like is a, is a grievance against him. And I think that he felt like he played well against the Vikings, which he did. And I think that he felt like he had earned the right to get some more playing time. And Wednesdays at practice are when they put in the defensive game plan. And I think that uh, Captain Munerlin was unhappy with what his role was going to be on Sunday against the Packers. And he let his emotions get the best of it, and he walked out. Yeah. I, I mean, it is. I, I think – it's kind of interesting to me now, as well, but I mean, we kind of, this is, we were all excited about getting him back and this might be one of those things we were just talking about with Taylor Moten. I mean, you know, Munderland's been good at his position at that nickel spot for quite some time with this, you know, evolving NFL pass game. And, you know, we were all excited. Look, we're finally getting a nickel cornerback. This is going to be good to go up against slot receivers and our nickel packages and stuff like this. And then... You know, he hasn't been getting a lot, and Shaq Thompson's been in there. And, look, Billy and I have questioned it multiple times when, I mean, I could go down a list on some, you know, bad formations defensively I think the Panthers have gotten taken advantage of. Now, not a lot, but it happens at least once or twice a game with Shaq Thompson in. But at the same time, I know Wilkes is an aggressive blitzer, and with that changes a lot of that personnel and stuff. So I kind of get it. It's, it's a – it's a two faced thing. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of something to really play into. And my my thought is the Panthers on a team to deal with attitudes. And you know he's been very vocal all season about his snap count. Is it the attitude that that's causing him to be on the sideline? Um, I mean, he did play well last week, but the Panthers they're not a team that puts up with with uh, players like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that Captain is pretty well is very well liked in the locker room, and I think that he uh, he's you know I think Coach Rivera likes him, and I just think that you know this may be something that they squash by Friday, um, or it may be something that lingers for a few weeks. But I think that you know he is a he's a fiery guy, and and we'll we'll see tomorrow. I mean, you can bet Captain Munderland is going to draw a lot of media attention. Uh, tomorrow in the locker room so we'll find out pretty quickly yeah um well i hope so you know it's it's just it seems to be an un un ongoing saga at this point for me because it's just you know he was one of the key players i was really excited about getting back this year and and he hasn't played and look the defense is one of the top defenses in the league so i can't argue you know what wilkes has done necessarily but at the same time like he made some great he had some great pass breakups in that, that Vikings game. Um, and, you know, I haven't completely sat down and watched all the film yet and seen what Colin Jones does, but apparently they're happy with what he did. And, he, you know, I don't recall him getting terribly beat while he was in the game. Um, yeah. And if you're not hearing about a cornerback's name, that's normally a good thing. So, no, I agree with you. I think that uh, Colin Jones has, has faced a lot of um, negative energy from Panthers uh, – Panthers Nation, if you will, yeah. and uh, that he uh, that that was when he was you know thrust into being a safety. But you know in this in this big nickel in this Buffalo nickel spot that they put him in, it, it kind of plays to his strengths. You know he's a he's a physical guy, he's quick, and you know Captain Munderland had a lot of nice plays. He was also um, 
on the 52-yard touchdown that Thielen caught, Keenan put it right over his head. A taller player knocks that thing down. But uh, Captain Munderland is 5'9 and, and couldn't get his hands up far enough to uh, to knock it down. So, you know, this it, – it, I'm not saying that Captain Munderland is a bad corner for being 5'9, but, you know, if that's Shaq Thompson in the same place, that ball probably doesn't go for a touchdown. So Right. And that's, I mean, that's a fair point. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's, it can be a, a coin flip at times with some of these things, man. I mean, it's easier, it's easier to sit back and say, you should be doing this, you should be doing this after you're seeing the play break down and you, you know what personnel would work better. I mean, if that was the case, every defensive coordinator in the league would probably be great at their job. But you can't, I mean, you can't do that. Uh, and that's unfortunate. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, look, Wilkes has done a hell of a job with this defense. There are times, like I said, sh- shit happens. And there's nothing you can do about it but try to bounce back and correct it the next week. So um, hopefully they keep doing that. I think it worked well last week without Shaq. Um, so especially considering I was worried going against that kind of passing offense coming in. But I think they did fine um, and got to the got to the quarterback. And speaking of quarterbacks, I, oh, go ahead. I, I think just one last point on Shaq. Yeah. I think that they can afford to rest him. Um, this week, um, well, I would rather them just keep hold him out for what may be a playoff run rather than put him out there right now, have him re-aggravate it, and then it's, and then it's something that lingers and they, they don't get him back for any of the playoffs. You know, I, I think that they have shown that they can survive without him. And the weirdly enough, the Vikings offense is a lot better than the, uh, than the Packers offense. So I do think that they could they could get by without Shaq Thompson for another week. Probably another two, yeah. if, if we're being honest. And I, I tend to agree with that with that assessment as well. It's uh, like you said, it, I, it's, if you're in that position, I guess the Panthers are in a good position for that loss to let him come back and completely heal. Kind of like with Ryan Khalil and Tyler, Tyler Larson in that aspect. I mean, Khalil tried to come back; it didn't work. Rest him for a few weeks. Larson's been doing fine, and. He gets more more reps, and now Khalil's back, and hopefully he stays back, and we've got a solid depth for Larson if we need him at guard. Yep. So absolutely. All right, let's let's hear the big uh, quarterback announcement. Yeah. I haven't really heard anything about the quarterbacks in these games. Yeah, so. really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like the uh, bad centers in the NFL, right? You just don't hear about Cam Newton and Aaron Rodgers. Um, so obviously, the Aaron big Rodgers one... is playing. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, uh, come on, you, you know you know you're a better source than that, Josh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh, that's yeah, crazy. It's breaking. I know you you wouldn't have predicted that, would you? With them on the cusp of making the playoffs, of course they're going to leave Brett Hundley in the game going against Carolina. Um, no, so guys, in case you were somehow living under a rock in NFL news over the last 24 hours, Aaron Rodgers is playing against the Panthers this Sunday at Bank of America Stadium. Obviously, that's the big news for um, Green Bay and. I mean, Billy's been talking about it. He's been saying he's felt they were going to come back. He I, was going to come back. Yeah, for, for weeks I've been saying the Packers, the Packers, the Packers are going to come back, and they're going to wreck the NFC playoff scene if, if Rodgers can come in and be healthy. And we saw a couple weeks ago when he was on TV, he can throw the ball. Um, we'll just see how he does in a game situation against a good defense. Um, if he is able to throw the ball, this is going to be a really, really tough game. What, what do you think, Josh? I, I think I was listening, like I said, y'all check out the Riot Reports. It is what it is podcast. It's on iTunes, and it's probably on a few other places. I'll let Josh tell you about that. But I tend to agree with your assessment, you and Zach's assessment on this whole thing with uh, Green Bay, because I'm not on the belief that Aaron Rodgers, like, of course, there's the, is the chance Aaron Rodgers comes back and does vintage Aaron Rodgers things. But this defense, this Green Bay defense is terrible. And, of course, they had the receiving weapons in Jordy, Devontae Adams, and they even got Randall Cobb back there. And then you got Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams, the rookie, running the ball. So what what do you think about that whole Rodgers is coming back, the NFC screwed mentality a lot of people have now? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I hesitate to say it because I feel like when I – it's like one of those, like, like a Beetlejuice type of thing. Like yeah. if I say Aaron Rodgers, I don't really, I'm not afraid of Aaron Rodgers. Then Bam, he y'all. comes out and put, yeah, exactly. Puts yeah. up eight touchdowns. I, I just think that I'm not, 
obviously Aaron Rodgers is one of the best quarterbacks probably of our generation. But you look at what is going on around him. That team is giving up – they are giving up sacks on almost 10% of their plays. Whew. And that, that's literally sacks, like not just quarterback pressures, not just quarterback hurries. And I don't know if you know, but the Panthers' pass rush is pretty good. Yeah, it's all right. Um, <laughs> so those two things alone – seem like they add up to a tough day at the office for a guy that just had 13 screws come out of his collarbone. Yeah. Um, and it's not fully healed. It, it just, and it's not fully healed. And, and I, you know, I know what Aaron Rodgers can do, but I just, it just doesn't seem like it, it's just not a good matchup for green Bay. Um, and then you look at their defense and their, their defense is not good either. Um, yeah, it's terrible. Their, their defense is given up like 24 points a game and uh, they they give up a ton of yardage on the ground, and it's you know again it's it's just a bad matchup for Green Bay going up against Carolina and the way that they're running the ball right now. Um, I, I just think that barring it, it's one of those things where I don't want to say well I just don't think that I think that the Panthers are just better, but it yeah I just think that the Panthers are better. I think they're <laughs> better they're a better overall team. And I get it that Aaron Rodgers is, is expected to come back and, you know, and then magic happens. And it is, it's a little bit scary to be in the NFC with him, but it's just, I, I just think the Panthers are better. Yeah, I, and I, I agree on the, like I said, the defensive aspect of things. They're ranked 25th in the league, giving up 354 yards per game. Um, and that has nothing, that side of the ball has nothing to do with Aaron Rodgers, people. So that that's going to be something... My my thing is is at home against this type of defense, Carolina should be able to score, and you know theoretically keep up with anything Aaron Rodgers does, and outside of our defense having a complete meltdown, which obviously hope does not happen, and I don't foresee happening. But um, I mean I tend to agree that I didn't even know about the the sack stat you just gave me. That was pretty crazy. Um, so did you say something, Billy? Yeah, it, that that was, that is a pretty it, that's a pretty crazy stat. Yeah, it's a uh, it's bad news. I I want to say now this one's just off the top of my head, but I think that Aaron Rodgers got sacked 19 times in the four, in the five games that he was in before he went out with the collarbone. Yeah, and that's that, a lot of sacks. Yeah, that that is a lot, and that's probably part of the reason you know he got injured, obviously. But the other thing with Aaron Rodgers is we saw with Case Keenum last week and Carolina Carolina's defense could have had nine sacks last week, and they ended up with six, yeah. which is still a great amount. But Case Keenum's mobility in the pocket, moving around, you know, being able to avoid, that's something, the mobility part of Aaron Rodgers is something that makes him who he is. And that's something Carolina's going to have to harp on. Now, obviously, they're not shying away from the competition. We've seen that all week in the, uh, the players talking to y'all over there at practice and whatnot. They're not, they've been preparing for him since the beginning when they found out, is what they've been saying anyway. Yeah, I, I think they've been, it seems like, that they never had any, just like everybody else did. You know, when when they saw wh- whatever four weeks ago that he could be eligible against Carolina, I think everybody knew. You know, the the Panthers, the players are just they're they're just guys. So right. they also read, they see Twitter and they see Facebook and they see, oh, Aaron Rodgers is going to be back in two weeks, and then look out NFC and, um, you know, Cam got super hyped today when someone told him that he was in the new gridiron heights. Uh, oh yeah, I don't know with his uh, fez. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he like legitimately he like lit up like a kid in like a kid that you just gave a bar a candy bar to. Like he was really what? That's Mama. awesome, Mama! Was, I made it. Yeah, was, he was so excited that he was in Gridiron High. But they they these guys have seen that they are, um, you know that that they knew Aaron Rodgers was going to be back, and they have been preparing for it mentally. And I think that. Game plan wise, they're preparing for it as well. Um, he's a uh, he's a tough quarterback. Obviously, he has a, he has a you know. I mean, we all know who Aaron Rodgers is. Aaron Rodgers is good. Yeah. So uh, it's it, it's like it's like preparing for Drew Brees, right? Uh, Drew Brees is good. It's going to be trouble. You can't let him beat you. You have to beat him. So that's that's what hopefully the Panthers' offense should be able to put up some points. Yeah, uh, that's. That's what I'm counting on anyway is, is the offensive side of the ball being able to put up points and the defense just coming up with a few stops that separate it. 
And, um, you know, and I'd like to see the offense not get <laughs> – y'all talked about this in your podcast as well, Josh um, – not go get too unaggressive. I'm not going to say full-blown conservative, but not too unaggressive. I've been – I've always been on the mindset that Shula is one – one possession away, one aggressive possession away from sealing games where he just seems to want to. And I know, like I said, it's not ultra conservative, but he's not. I feel like he's taking rhythm away from the offense that opens those leads up. And that's, I mean, that's a debate for a whole other day because, I mean, we could spend a lot of time on that. Um, but I just, I don't want to see that happen, especially against Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I just don't think you can do that. I think you need, if you get up, you know, 14. 17, okay, but when you're up 10 and two quarters to go, I don't uh uh-uh, don't give me that. Please. Don't go don't go conservative and give them a minute and a half left in the fourth quarter, down by one touchdown or down by four points or whatever. Because I, I I don't I don't want to see that. Uh, and if we do get the lead, I, I don't want us to go conservative at all. Put, put the put put the cleat down on his throat and just just finish the game. Um, because Rodgers is a great football player, and he can make those comebacks. And I, I don't want to rely on our defense too much. I want our offense to be able to outscore them. Yeah, and our defense doesn't really go conservative with Steve yeah. Wilkes. So, um. no, he doesn't. He doesn't understand the meaning of the word conservative. And I, I will say that with Rodgers coming back, I was listening to a sports show today on the radio. The Packers were one and twenty to get to the playoffs. Aaron Rodgers came back. They're now one and ten in Vegas. Yeah, but it, and that they they need some variables to get away. Obviously, they they need to win out, um, and they've got a tough schedule. They got us. They got Minnesota left, um, and then I, I forgot who their other, other opponent it was. But those two alone are going to be tough. One of them's a division Detroit. matchup. Detroit, yeah, and that's that's no guarantee. They're, that's two division matchups for them. If they, what I read, uh, if they win out. They make the playoffs because they win the tiebreaker. They hold a tiebreaker. They don't necessarily win it. They need other things to go their way for that tiebreaker to be in effect. But it doesn't matter because we're going to win. We're covering the Panthers, and I don't care about Green Bay. We need to just go ahead and take care of our business. Um, Carolina's defense, obviously, number five in the league. And we talked about it. Well, Billy and I have talked about it, Josh, and I was telling you this before the show. Y'all pointed out something that we have been talking about and I, I brought up when I noticed looking through the game logs, Carolina is allowing 100 more yards, total yards per game than they did the first eight games. It was from 264 to 364, I think, was that stat. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, two, yeah something like that. It's, yeah. it's, it's within two yards of whatever you said. Right. So, but I mean, that's – now, obviously they've still won in that – during that time, but it's it brought up the whole thing of is this are the older guys on this defense starting to slow down some? I mean, what do you think about fans saying that right now? I mean, I've seen it been talked about a lot. We brought it up on one of our post game. It was after the the uh, Vi- the Saints post game actually, um, and it got brought up about the pass rush and the older guys on the line there not being able to get to the quarterback. And then, of course, they come out and shut everybody up against the Vikings. So what are your thoughts on that whole situation? Yeah, it's a tough uh, it's a tough question because it, it, it's easy to say that the evidence, the empirical evidence points to them slowing down because of age. That It just makes perfect sense. They played eight games. They played very well, and now as the season has worn on, the defense has kind of let up because, I mean, they are. They're the oldest, literally the oldest defense in the league um, by the numbers. Yep. And you look at that happening, but then you watch them on tape, and the reason that they're giving up so many uh, so much yardage is because of missed tackles. Right. That's, yeah. I mean, that is the... That is the absolute number one reason why they have given up so much, uh, so many yardage and so much big plays. They've given up five plays of 50 yards or more in the last five games. That's been our biggest part um, was missed tackles. And I mean, they've been terrible, bad missed tackles, too. They're, I mean, it's not like there's a debatable point. Some of them have just been really bad. Even Luke's taken some bad angles, which is extremely rare. Um, but yeah, I, can, that's, I think that's exactly what plays a part in that. Yeah, I, I just, it's, 
Huh, it's a shame, or it's uh, not. It's a shame, but I just don't. I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer for it. I know the easy thing to say is, "Well, they're wearing down," but <laughs> yeah. I don't know that that's true because you know you look at what they do to keep everybody fresh. Their defensive line rotation is so tight and it goes so deep that um, that it really is like the, the defensive line. I don't think is the problem. And then you look at their linebackers, and then you got guys like Luke Keekley and Shaq Thompson who are young relatively. Right. So then there's really only one linebacker that could be wearing down due to age, and he is ageless. Yeah. And then the cornerbacks are young, and the safeties are old. So it's like maybe Mike Adams and Kirk Coleman are wearing down a little bit. But I don't, I mean, Coleman hasn't played particularly well, but I don't know if you can. I, I think Adams has actually played pretty well for the past month or so. So I agree. It's, and I, you know, Josh, this is, this is a, an opinion of mine. Is I really think this defense going from more zone under McDermott to more man has played a huge role in guys like Daryl Worley. Even James Bradbury has not had a, the year a lot of people were expecting him to have. But you know, they were a predominantly more zone team last year, and I think that's played a big part. Even with guys like Kurt Coleman. Um, you, you know, that's, they're used to being ball hawks, and when you're running man, you, you got your back turned to the quarterback, and that's where they can really hurt you if you're going downfield. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think that it's – I don't know whether it's made them seem seem worse or just put more emphasis on their mistakes because when you're in man coverage and you make a mistake, it's pretty obvious that you were covering somebody and now right. they're open. But in zone coverage, then it's easier to be like, well, no, I don't know, maybe there's a blown, <laughs> uh, you know, who knows? I, don't, I was I was trying to be, oh, you could point at somebody else and be like, oh, what were you doing? <laughs> you know, on TV, you can't tell what's going on, so you just if you're if I was a, if I was somebody in the secondary, I would constantly be pointing at areas of the field, and then when my teammates were like asking me why I was pointing, they'd be like, oh, I don't know, I was just like pointing at uh, like the yard marker or something. But then when you watch it on TV it looks like I'm just constantly pointing out other people making mistakes. Yeah. That would be what I would do if I was in the secondary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I could totally see you doing that too. Um, all right, so you know that'll kind of that's a good that's a good intro into our key matchups for the game. And I think it's really simple for me. I think it's our pass rush getting to Aaron Rodgers and forcing a quick throws and getting sacks. Because they have receiving weapons. They have Jordy Nelson. They have Devontae Adams. They have Randall Cobb. Um, and it doesn't really matter. As long as you got a guy that can catch, Aaron Rodgers can typically get the ball to him. Like I said, we don't, we don't know what he's going to come out and play like because, I mean, he's coming off eight weeks without playing in the game. His collarbone is still not fully healed. But, I mean, I, other than that, I don't really see – like I said, that defense is bad. I don't really see how there could be any other key matchup. Billy, what do you have anything it, other it, than that? It would be our pass rush getting to get into Rodgers. And he eight weeks in a collarbone and 13 screws. How many hits, if we do get sacks, can he take? Yeah. I mean, that's – and is he going to play scared? Um, is it going to be easy for us to sack him? I mean, he's going to come out and play because he's an athlete. But I, I'd be scared of that collarbone. And Josh, I can't believe we made it this whole uh, show so far with nobody in the comments saying, "Remember when Tony Romo came back from a collarbone injury?" <laughs> I and that yeah. that drives me crazy because I, one of the Carolina Panthers groups, they the, the fans in there love to say, "Remember what happened," and we'll just hurt another person. I don't want to see anybody get yeah, hurt. Yeah, right, exactly. And I don't want to wish that on them, but I want to see him get hit. But I hope he doesn't get hurt. I don't want to end somebody's career. I don't want to break his collarbone. But if we have to hit him and that, you know, makes him play a different game than Aaron Rodgers plays, I'm totally fine with it. Oh, yeah. So who – What would? I mean, would you agree there that that's – do you have any other key matchup that you might would be looking at and on, Josh? Um, I, I think that uh, whoever, whoever you want to match up with Clay Matthews, I think is going to make a big difference. Um. Yeah, that's fair. But, uh, I mean, I, I think that they need to be able to run the ball. Um, they need to be able to run the ball really well against the Packers in order to be successful. Um, and I think that is that, you know, that's going to have such a big 
big reason for it is going to be uh, probably Ryan Khalil is going to be kind of getting to that second level. And it, it might end up being a guy like Ed Dixon, you know, but I think that has really helped. Ed Dixon has been excellent in a blocking game the past few weeks. I so, um, yeah, I think that that will have a lot to do with it. But, I, I, yeah, I mean, if you can put – if you can kind of get Aaron Rodgers off his spot and make him nervous a little bit right off the bat, I think that's going to be – that's that'll do the job, you know. I, I think that they're really good at passing the ball, but I don't know that they're going to be so good at pass protecting – yeah, I just don't. I just don't see it. Not not you with know? the blitzing they, that Steve Wilkes is gonna bring to him. Yeah, I yeah. yeah nah, I, Getting his face at the beginning, and he's gonna play. He's gonna play nervous. And now that you bring it up, the the Packers run game really another part, obviously that plays a key in Carolina being top of the league in time of possession is Carolina run, being able to run the ball successfully, which I don't. They shouldn't have a problem against this defense. Is just been really bad, and but if you can run the clock and pound it down and keep Aaron Rodgers off the field, obviously that's also a, a plus. I mean, anything you can do to keep him off the field long periods of time is going to be a positive for Carolina. I, I agree with you. Can I, can I, can I give you a weird uh, hypothesis that I've been working on today? So, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I've been working on this. Well, not working on this. It's just kind of been bonking around through my head. And the Panthers kind of, they seem to play the opposite of how you think they're going to play. So, you know, they get blown out at week three and they go to up to New England. And nobody thinks they're going to beat New England. And mm-hmm. then they come out and they they put it on New England. The next week, oh, that was probably a fluke. They go out and they put it on Detroit, at Detroit. Um, a, few weeks la- a few weeks later, they go into Chicago. It should be the easiest thing in the world. They can't move the ball at all. And they turn the ball over three times and they lose. And, you know, it's kind of been like that the whole season. And for me, I was almost, I'm almost a little bit glad that Aaron Rodgers is going to play this week so that it turns a little bit of the, it turns a little bit of the, um, the narrative away from, well, look at how good Carolina is. And they are, they just beat Minnesota. And now they're going to play Brett Hundley and the Packers. They should breeze through this game. It's going to be great. Now there's a little bit of doubt cap. Yep. And I think that Cam and I think that the Panthers, they they like that. Uh, you know, obviously Cam likes to be successful. But I think that they they do like a little bit of that underdog chip on their shoulder kind of role as opposed to the 14-point favorite. Yeah, and I think that's a this great season, point. At least. If you remember back in 2015, this is actually that actually fits in well with the 2015 season and that Cowboys game because Tony Romo came back that game, and the narrative went from, you know, is Carolina going to go, you know, 16 and 0 to, oh, Romo's back, Carolina's going down this week, and all of a sudden they came out and blistered the Cowboys. Romo left the game. Um, but I, I think that's actually a great point. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it that way because after that Vikings, I mean the Panthers played really well against the Vikings, and it you know they let them back in it late, but they controlled that entire game except for maybe five minutes, and that narrative could have easily been if Brett Hundley was still playing, who was coming into his own by the way the last few weeks, um, they could have easily been going into that game a little more leisurely if you want to say that, and then you know the pressure been all on them to, to keep up what they've been doing. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, def- uh, I, I definitely agree. Uh, it's, it's exactly how you think the Panthers are going to play all year. That Chicago game was the biggest heartbreaker because we just beat two great teams. And I would I, I think it, it helps the team when they have that chip on their shoulder coming, when they say, oh, big Aaron Rodgers coming back. We have no chance now. And that really uh, puts the intensity into their play. Yeah, I, I think that has a lot to do with it, and um, it's just a uh, the other thing. If we're if we're thinking about now, now I'm just completely pulling stuff out of my head. But uh, <laughs> if you want to pull out reasons why the Panthers might struggle, is um, the Packers play a three four defense, and the only other three four defense that the Panthers faced was 
Chicago. Yeah. So and they've historically struggled I, I, against three four defenses for the last and under the Ron Rivera era anyway. They have San Francisco years ago. Yeah, but yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, no, it's true. It's all so, fair. I just want know, to see – my biggest thing with Carolina is consistency when winning games. Because, I mean, they've – it's like like you talked about with the Chicago thing. Even though, you know, we shot ourselves in the foot against Philadelphia, I still think we could have beat that team on Thursday night football. But the two weeks prior to that, we were playing classic – I mean, it was what Carolina was built to do on defense and on offense, play action, running the ball, Cam doing his thing. It was just working – and then you lose to Philadelphia, then you go and lose to Chicago, and you bounce back, you win a few games, and you go play New Orleans. Now, granted, New Orleans is a great team. Um, easily could be in it for the Super Bowl this year representing the NFC. No doubt about that. But you come out and you put that first great drive together, and then you kind of falter back. You come out against Minnesota, and you just you can't be stopped. And I just want to see the consistency for it. Obviously, now we need it for about, what is it, six weeks, five weeks yeah. now? Um, I just want to see that consistency so we know what we're going to get week in and week out. Kind of what you were talking about with that narrative earlier. I, I just want to see more of that personally, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, no, it's uh, I mean, it's one of those things where you just don't – you literally, we just don't know what we're going to see from this Carolina team from week to week, and that is – not good, but also it gives it gives them a very high ceiling and a very low floor. So right. there, it's just you just don't know. And they have beaten themselves. I mean, it's the most cookie cutter thing in the world. But I will continue to scream it from the rooftops that the Panthers, if they do not turn the ball over, win games. That is the bottom. That is one hundred percent the bottom line. It, and it is. There is no other. There is no other stat that that defines this team as much as turnovers. There are nine and four in their nine games. They've turned the ball over eight times, and in their four losses, they've turned it over ten. Yep, and they've been and they're not even like they're bad turnovers. I mean, receivers dropping balls, Jonathan Stewart catching and lateraling it to Eagles cornerback for a touchdown. I mean, these are things you just it, it it's almost scripted sometimes the way they they shoot themselves in the foot. And that's really, I mean, you can say, you know, turnovers can win ball games. Obviously, that's true, and but it proves no more than, like you said, in Carolina this year. And if they're taking care of the football, they're fine. And that's something they've got to do. Um, I, I completely, because I mean, it's like you said, you give any quarterback enough opportunities in a close game, he can make you pay. And it's a momentum shift every time it happens. Yep, you're absolutely right. So. I guess we'll jump into some predictions here, Josh. Are you ready for a prediction? Oh, I'm gonna. I have to give a prediction. You don't have I predict to. Predict a great game by everybody. No, no, no it'll be fine. Huh? <laughs> All right. Well, I know Billy's gonna give a prediction. He typically gives one. I was almost right last week. He was almost right. 18 points in like five minutes. I'm sorry. Horseshoes and hand grenades. Um, I think we have to score 31 points to win. That's my prediction. Ooh. That's a lot of points, yeah, I baby Bubba. I, 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 I <laughs> baby know, Bubba, what's I, up with you? <laughs> I think we have to score thirty-one to win. Ooh, I, I don't, I don't think we necessarily have to score thirty-one. Okay, if we're going to play the numbers game like that, I, wait, I'm so confused about what the predictions are. Do I do? Do I need to predict <laughs> the number of points that we'll need to score to win? You can, you can predict it however you want. Billy's saying he he thinks if we score thirty-one or less. Oh, yeah, if we score less than 31, the Packers are going to win. He's saying he thinks the Panthers' defense so gives up 31 you're points. The, the, the Packers yeah. are going to score 30. That's that's, that's my stretch, yes. I would, okay. I, All right. Yeah, I. it's I, just it, because, I mean, we know the defense is good, but I don't, like we said, we don't know what we're going to get with the offense, with the team. And if we score less than 31, we lose. Well, I got some people in here drop, dropping some uh, predictions in the comments for you, Josh. I'll, I'll give you Devin Smith is saying 41-37. I'm guessing these are all Panthers wins, by the way. Um, Antonio <laughs> Correll is saying 27-13. And Corey and Amanda Dorsey are saying 31-28. All of those are Carolina victories. I tend to agree. I'm not Go ahead. I'm not accepting any predictions from people that share a Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well. There you go. Um, see, 
I, I really don't see. I don't know. I can't. I can't do it this week. I, I've predicted something for the Vikings game. I just had a vibe that they were going to pull off the upset um, over the Vikings. We had to score thirty-one against the Vikings last week. Just saying. All right, I, I can I give a prediction? Yeah, I got a go couple ahead. predictions. Yeah. All right, so here's my prediction. My prediction is that uh, um, Greg Olson catches a touchdown, and that uh, Kurt Coleman has an interception. That sounds pretty good. I feel good about those two. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, obviously I'd like the second one, and I'd like the first one. I I kind of. You know, if I'm being greedy about fantasy, I'd like to have that touchdown from Greg Olson last week. But I will take the Panthers' victory <laughs> every week over it. So, that's fine. Um, I'm officially out of the playoffs there now, but that's all right. As long as the Panthers keep winning, I could I could care less. I couldn't care less, excuse me. I'm in the constellation. You're in your own playoffs. I'm in the constellation. I got Aaron Rodgers coming up. I are. Oh. Part of me thought about starting him, but I'm going to start Jared Goff. Yeah. Well, there's your fantasy there insight you for this week, guys. So there you go. You have Josh Klein is predicting an interception by Kurt Coleman and a touchdown from Greg Olson. Booyah. And that sounds like a Panthers victory to me. That's what I'm going to roll with. Um, Josh, give them a shout-out. Uh, obviously, it's a home game. The Roaring Riot's going to be in full effect out there doing their home tailgate like they do every week. Um, give them a quick rundown on that for, guys, for people who may not be aware um, and familiar with the Roaring Riot. Yeah, absolutely. The Roaring Riot is the uh, Panthers fan club. Uh, We are not only in Charlotte, we are nationwide. So if you're a Panthers fan that does not live in Charlotte, uh, there may be a Roaring Riot chapter in your town. Uh, Personally, the Denver chapter is the best chapter, Mile High Cats. Um, But I'm (laughs) no bias there. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, And the Roaring Riot, for every home game, they have uh, a tailgate. It's at Cedar Yard 1. Um, if you're a member and you're a guest, there's free food. There's $2 Nota beers, $2 Jack Daniel drinks. Like, it's, I mean, it's the best deal in town. And just the most fun party. Percussion is there. Sometimes the top cats are there. You know, the, there's a band. There's a DJ. It's, it's always a fun time out there at a Roaring Riot tailgate. And uh, obviously, we go on all of the uh, away games as well. The Roaring Riot has trips. So if you were looking for New Year's Eve plans where you wanted to be extremely nervous and maybe playing the Atlanta Falcons for a playoff spot, uh, New Year's Eve, we will be live and in effect in Atlanta. And uh, you can check me personally out. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Josh Fine Rules. Uh, but the Riot Report, we're at therightreport.com. We try to make our Panthers coverage a little bit different than everyone else's, um, but it is everything that you would possibly want. News, analysis, film breakdown, audio, video, photos, anything else. Um, yeah, check us out, therightreport.com. Yep, like I said, to start the show, y'all been killing it. Um, I've been enjoying all the stuff, especially the audio clips. You know, you don't get that a lot of places without having to like pull up an interview on YouTube or something. Um, but yeah, y'all keep doing a great job. And guys, I can't stress enough the away game trips for the Roaring Riot. We did the New Year's Eve last year in Tampa Bay at Shepherd's Resort, and it was fantastic. It was a blast. I, I don't know if I said it, it was New Year's Eve, the um, last game of the season. We lost, but. It was a great time. Obviously, there's gonna be a, there could be a lot more on the line for this Atlanta game, and you need to get out there and raise some hell for the Carolina Panthers and get loud for them. It'd be a great time. Josh, I appreciate you jumping on the show, buddy. Um, I hope to have you back again soon. We're going to get out of All here. Right, yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, yeah. man. We'll catch you all next time. Yep, see you.